Well, good morning, or good evening, afternoon, wherever you happen to be. My name is Josh Walters, and I'm the campus pastor here at the Mount Pleasant campus, one of the teaching pastors here at Seacoast, and we are so excited that you're here to worship with us this weekend. I want to welcome you if you're joining us online or in the chapel at an off-site campus, wherever you happen to be, we're excited that you are here as well. I want to give a special shout out to our Manning campus. My wife actually had the opportunity to drive over to Manning this past weekend and speak to the women there at the campus, and she came home fired up, said y'all had decorated it like a wedding. She was blessed by your hunger just to study God's word and experience and encounter him. And best of all, for me anyway, uh, she sent, uh, you sent her home with some of the best tasting cupcakes I have had in my whole life. And so Aunt Mama, Betty Crocker, whoever you are, uh, all I can think of was Psalm 34, 8. Y'all know that one? Taste and see that the Lord is good. And he is good in Manning. So give him a hand. We're excited for you, ladies. Thankful for you. Anytime you want to bless our church with that goodness, you are welcome. Well, last week we kicked off a series called AD where we're looking at what happened after Easter. Following the death and resurrection of Jesus, where did the disciples go? How did the the church come about? What were the makings of the movement that we now live in and experience today? I'm really excited about this series because while we're talking about it, studying through the book of Acts on the weekend, we're also trailing with the NBC television series AD where they're providing us uh, with clips of the following show each week. So throughout the message, we'll get to see a little bit of what it might have been like. And it's providing a helpful visual for us as we study God's word. I'll never forget a couple years ago when we went to Israel as a church, uh, a bunch of people went. It forever changed the way that I read scripture. Seeing the Sea of Galilee, walking the streets of Jerusalem, man, has made the scriptures come alive to me. In fact, while we were there, Pastor Jason and I, our missions pastor, may or may not have tried to walk on the Sea of Galilee um, and actually were able to take a step or two before we decided that we would, we would just go for a swim. <laughs> but either way, man, it changed the way we read, I read scripture. So I'm excited for the series because I think the, the TV show is gonna provide us with a helpful visual as we're in God's word here on the weekend. Today we're gonna be in Acts chapter two. Uh, which is arguably one of the most important chapters in the New Testament. But before we get started, why don't you join me? Let's take a minute and pray. God, we thank you so much for this time together. We praise you, God, for your word, uh, that it does not return void, that it's living and active, that it accomplishes exactly what it set out to do. So God, we would ask today, knowing that you are our loving Father, uh, that you would be present with us, that our hearts would be open, that our minds would be attentive, to all that you have for us, God, that we would come away having experienced uh, you do the miraculous in our lives. So we thank you for this time. Pray that your word would accomplish all that you would have it do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it was June of 2000, six months after Katie and I figured out that the world wasn't going to end. (laughs) How many of you remember where you were when you rang in the year 2000? You remember that? Typically on New Year's, you know, I'm like, three, two, one, Happy New Year! Strategically position myself near Katie so I can get some New Year's loving. Fellas, you know what I'm talking about? With five kids, man, you got to take it wherever, however you can get it. I'll take a little sugar, <laughs> kiss or two, It'll work for me. So this year in particular, it was a little bit different because I said three, two, one. It was like Happy New Year. You know, like, what's gonna happen? <laughs> Once we realized the ceiling wasn't gonna cave in and the internet still worked, everything was good. So six months later, it's June, Katie and I are in Germantown, Tennessee at an event called One Day. Uh, It was part of the Passion Experience Tour, which sounds like uh, a special event for a dating young couple to attend. Doesn't sound like the kind of thing that might honor the Lord. Hey babe, you wanna go to the Passion Experience Tour? (laughs) Doggone right I do, what is that, you know? (laughs) It was kinda like a Christian Woodstock. Uh, I was new in my faith and over the course of a three or four day period, they had guys like uh, John Piper and Francis Chan, Louis Giglio, some phenomenal speakers, incredible worship teams, David Crowder, Chris Tomlin, Matt Redman, uh, the Passion Band. It was just an incredible couple days. It was honestly one of the first times in my life where I experienced the power and presence of God, uh, where the Holy Spirit seemed to be at work. Now, just to give you a little bit of context, I grew up in a very traditional Southern Baptist church, uh, would go to church dressed up. The book of Acts was referred to as the book of one-time occurrences. Uh, this was stuff that happened in Scripture, but don't show up thinking it's going to happen on a Sunday morning or throughout your work week. It's just what happened when the Spirit of God was poured out 
for the very first time. And at this event called One Day, there's thousands of college students that are just going after God. And the best I can describe it, it was like the joy of the Lord had been poured out on the place. You know, students that could have been doing anything, fasting, praying, the land had been prayed over for like six months. You know, all students just there going after God. And at one point during worship, uh, just like a spiritually charged environment, it was incredible. I turn over to look at Katie, uh, which, you know, me looking at Katie tends to help my worship anyway. It's just God's gift to the earth. But I would turn over to look at Katie, and she wasn't singing. So I was like, what's going on? And I noticed that her mouth was kind of moving, uh, and, and there were words coming out, uh, but it weren't, they weren't songs. So I kind of pull in close and realized she was kind of speaking in tongues of some kind. And for this traditional Southern Baptist boy, uh, I didn't have the faith to believe that it was from God or biblical uh, or of the Lord, but I did have the faith to lay hands on her and pray that thing all the way back to heaven. You know, <laughs> I didn't know what it was, but all I could say was, man, that is weird. You know, I'm thinking, God, I'm a relatively normal dude, and if, and if we're on a path of becoming one, you're going to have to do something about that, you know, because that ain't normal. You know? <laughs> but I can't work with that. You know, so we grew in our faith, studied God's word, later prayed that it would come back, and, and it did. But man, I remember at the time, having never seen or experienced anything like that, thinking, what in the world? Have you ever seen or experienced something like that for yourself? Where it's, God seemed to be present? It was unlike anything that you had experienced, or maybe a friend told you about an experience or an encounter they had, and the only reply or response you had to it was, man, that is weird. For some of you, that's your experience every weekend here at Seacoast. <laughs> Grew up in a traditional background. You show up here, you see grown men crying, raising their hands, pinning things to crosses. You're like, man, I like this place. I feel welcome, but that's weird. <laughs> I'm going to stay right here in my seat. Living in a natural world while experiencing uh, and figuring out how to process the supernatural can be very challenging for us. I mean, it's true in our day, and it was true in Jesus' day as well. Earlier I said that Acts chapter 2 was arguably one of the most important chapters in the New Testament, and that's because it's when the Spirit of God was poured out on the people of God for the very first time. I mean, they did not know how to respond to it. In verses of Acts 2, chapter, uh, verses 12 and 13 there on your outline, this was their response. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does it mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. <laughs> and I love their response because it's a totally normal, natural response to a supernatural experience. Think about the last time you were around someone who had had too much wine. And you're just like, ah, you totally dismiss or discount whatever it is they might say or do because you, you feel like, ah, it's just not them. They don't know what they're doing. And that's how people responded. They had no experience, no context for what they were seeing or experiencing. It was nine in the morning. And they're saying, oh, man, they've, they've had too much wine. See, the Bible tells us that God is three in one, that he is Father, Son, and Spirit. The word that's used for that is the Trinity. And to some degree, we understand the role of the Father. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world, he endured the pain of sending his son and seeing his suffering because he desires to live in a relationship with you. I'm reminded of the way Jesus taught the disciples to pray, our Father who art in heaven. Or when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane before he would be arrested and endure suffering, he cried out to God, Abba, Father, literally Daddy, not my will, but yours be done. Be with me under incredible pressure and facing incredible suffering. The way that Jesus talked about the Father, the example that he set for us, allows me to know that I can see and experience him as my loving heavenly Father. To some degree, we understand the role and purpose of the Son, that he was 100% man, but 100% God that he was the visible representation of an invisible God. If you want to know the Father, then look at the Son. Loving, forgiving. Scripture says that he came full of grace and truth. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. To some degree, we understand the Father and the Son, but man, you talk about the Spirit, you know? 
And we all come away baffled. You know, what was that? We don't know how to process it. So today I'd like for us to take a few minutes as we look in Acts chapter 2 to ask several critical questions about the Holy Spirit. Not so much the things that we want to know, because if there's a thousand people here, we would have a thousand things that we want to know. What's up with the laying on of hands or speaking in tongues, anointing people with oil? How does that work? You know, there's a lot that we want to know, but what are the things that we need to know? So several questions about the Holy Spirit. Number one there on your outlines, what is it? What is it? Now, what I love about this question uh, is that it's the way that most of us think, but fundamentally, everything about the question is wrong. (laughs) Oftentimes, we'll refer to the Holy Spirit much in the same way uh, that a guy without kids does about children. You know what I'm talking about? When a guy that doesn't have any kids, or maybe a new dad has their first kid, oh, they're so beautiful. (laughs) Then they say, can I hold it? And then they're like this, and they hold the baby, and like, oh, he's crying. What's wrong with it? You know? I'm like, well, one, you're standing like Shrek, dude. You're like, loosen up. You know? <laughs> Secondly, it's not an it. It's a he, you know? The Holy Spirit is a person. So there on your outlines, uh, scratch out what and it and write who and he. Who is he? Now, it would be impossible for us to come up with a definition of the Trinity that would capture who he is in his entirety, but to give us some kind of foundation to work from, I came up with a definition there on your outlines that says this. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, a gift from the Father to believers that lives in us and can be upon us in order to fulfill the purposes of God and draw us into relationship with him. Romans 8.27 tells us that the Holy Spirit has the capacity to think. Romans 15.30 tells us that the Holy Spirit can love, that he has feelings. 1 Corinthians 12.11 tells us that he wills or determines. So much like us, the Holy Spirit has mind, will, and emotions. This is why the Bible tells us that when we act in ways that are contrary uh, to the life that God would have us live, that we can grieve the spirit that lives within us. For example, uh, not that this has happened recently or happened this week, but if I were to slam a door in our house out of frustration, you know, the door wouldn't come back at me like, bro, why'd you do that, man? Like, I'm a new door, you know? But my wife would because she is a person with feelings. Well, much in the same way when we say things, when we do things, when we entertain thoughts or motivations that are not honoring of God, we can grieve the third person of the Trinity, of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, making it very difficult for us to hear from him or be ministered to by him. So who is he? He is a person, the third person of the Trinity, the power of God that's alive inside of us, that can be upon us for the fulfilling of his mission that draws us into a relationship with him. Second question is, when did he come? When did he come? Well, God being the Trinity has never ceased to be that. He has always been Father, Son, and Spirit. In Genesis 1, 1 and 2, there on your outlines, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and, God was hu- and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. All throughout the Old Testament, from creation to the New Testament, we saw the Spirit of God at work. In Numbers 27, we see that the Spirit of God was in Joshua. In Daniel chapter 4, we see that the Spirit of God was in Daniel. In Exodus 31, we saw the Spirit of God empower the craftsmen who were building and working on the temple. We also saw that the Spirit of God would come and go. He was upon Samson and he was upon Saul, but later he would leave them. Well, in Acts chapter 2, the fulfilling of God's desire to dwell in and be among his people would happen on that day of Pentecost. There on your outlines, it says this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. But on this day of Pentecost, this was a feast celebrated by the Jews where they would remember the events of Exodus chapter 20 and chapter 32, where God had delivered them from being enslaved to the Egyptians and established them at the people, as a people. It was here, they were gathered at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses would go up upon the mountain, and there on your outline, this is what happened. God appeared in a very loud noise, in fire, 
It was here that he wrote his law on stone, that he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Uh, They didn't know what it looked like to live or be a people of God, to live rightly. So he gave them a law that if they would follow, uh, that they might live righteous lives. There, because of their disobedience and rebellion, 3,000 people died. It was here that God would establish them as the nation of Israel. Well, here in the New Testament, on this day of Pentecost, here again, God appears in a very loud noise, in fire. He wrote his law on men's hearts. See, righteousness could not be attained by way of the law. Uh, But because the finished work of Jesus on the cross, uh, the, the price for our sin had been paid in full, and the law of love could be written on the hearts of men that we might, again, live in communion in a relationship with God. Upon hearing this good news, 3,000 people would be saved, and it was here that God established his church, the vehicle by which all of the world would hear and receive this good news. See, it was in no way did Jesus come to do away with the laws, the feasts, the festivals, the words of the prophets, but to fulfill them, that we might again live in relationship with God. Matthew 5, 17, there on your outlines, Jesus told the disciples, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It was on this day and from this day forward that the gift of the Holy Spirit would dwell in and could come upon everyone who identified themselves as a Christ follower. So who is he? When did he come? Number three there on the back of your outlines, what does he do? What does he do? This is the excitingly mysterious question uh, that if we're not careful, we can turn into the tagline of one of those medical info commercials. You know? If you or someone you love has recently contacted the Holy Spirit, please contact a pastor immediately. <laughs> Side effects may include but are not limited to extreme acts of generosity, the laying on of hands and rubbing of oil on others and attempts of experiencing the miraculous. You know? <laughs> we talk about it in a way so as to say like, man, don't get that on you. you know? <laughs> you might not get it off. (laughs) One of the most practical messages I've heard on the functions of the Holy Spirit came from Pastor Greg last year. It was Pentecost weekend. We were in a series called Outrageous, and he preached a message called Surprising Power. I listened to it twice again this week and was just blown away to think, man, Pastor Greg's been in this pulpit for 27 years, and he's still preaching some of the best messages I've ever heard. Isn't that incredible? Such a gift. Well, uh, I thought about just re-preaching his message again to see if you would recognize it, but figured I should come up with something (laughs) a little original. But I did take his seven points there on your outline. Seven functions of the Holy Spirit. When you are confused, he will guide you. When you are hurting, he will comfort you. When you are powerless, he will empower you. When you're forgetful, he'll remind you. The speechless, he'll speak through you. When you're sinful, he'll correct you. When you're empty, he will fill you. And those are just seven functions. But if you were to do a search through the New Testament, maybe Google, what does the Holy Spirit do? There's 50 plus passages on works that the Holy Spirit did in and through people in the New Testament. But looking just in Acts chapter two, there's two primary functions, two things we see the Holy Spirit doing. The first of which was empowering the disciples to fulfill his mission. Jesus had breathed the Holy Spirit upon them in the Gospels, but then in Luke 24, 49, there on your outline, Jesus told them, I am going to send you what my Father promised, but stay in Jerusalem until you have been clothed with power from on high. What I love about this, he didn't say stay in Jerusalem until you're certain in your faith as to who I am and what I did on the cross. He didn't say stay in Jerusalem until you muster up the boldness and the courage to speak hard truth to people. He said, wait until you've been clothed with power from on high. And the visual that I get is that of putting on a jacket, sliding on some gloves, maybe putting on a hoodie, so that their touch would have a power to it that was not their own. So that as they spoke, their words would carry weight, carry substance that was not of their own. They didn't get 50 days outside of the cross and muster up courage to go and share the good news but they received an empowering from the Holy Spirit to go and fulfill the mission that he had called them to. There on your outlines we see it says, Peter and the 11 got up to speak to the crowds and this is what he said. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, 
He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Like, man, just 50 days before, these men of great courage were cowards. At the cross of Christ, they had scattered, denied him, ran. Yet now that they've been clothed with power from on high, they have a a power within them to do exactly what he had called them to do. So the Holy Spirit empowered them to fulfill his mission. The second thing that we see the Holy Spirit doing is empowering people to live. Here are the people who were responsible for the death, for the crucifixion of Jesus, are now hearing this news that God has made him both Lord and Messiah. And this was their response in verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They didn't just have a change of mind where they thought, man, you know, there ain't nobody else feeding 5,000, you know? We're not seeing anybody raised from the dead or walk on water. It's been a little quiet in Jerusalem, you know? But there was an openness in them to receive the truth of God, that he loves them, that he wants to have a relationship with him, that their sin has separated him from him. If there is an openness in you today to receive the good news, to process the things of God, you need to know it is not by chance. It is not an accident. God is empowering you to live to take some steps forward that you might experience the abundant life available to us in Christ. Another way of saying those two things, he's empowered us to live and empowered us to fulfill his mission is there on your outlines. The Holy Spirit is in us for us and he's upon us for others. The Bible tells us that he's sealed in us until the day of redemption, that he's given to us as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. He's in us to guide us, to comfort us, to lead us, to work in us, to mold us and shape us, to sanctify us, that we might look like and become uh, more and more like Jesus. But he is upon us for others. So that the call for each of us that's the same as the disciples to go into all the world and make disciples wouldn't rest upon your ability to speak eloquently or memorize God's word or attend church every weekend, but that you would be clothed with power from on high. That somehow as you share your story, if you give testimony to the work that God's done in your life, that it would have power in the life of others to literally allow them, empower them to step into the life that God has for them. If you were to apply the functions of the Holy Spirit that we see here in Acts chapter two to your life today, which of those people groups would you be in? Would you be sitting among the disciples, maybe rocking some biblical Jerusalem joggers? You know what those are, joggers? They're like God's gift to athletic gear. Sweatpants, tapered at the end. You don't know? All right. They're incredible. Anyway, maybe a cloak, tunic, whatever. Would you be sitting in the upper room waiting for some fresh empowering of the Holy Spirit to help you get through a season of life that you might feel stuck in, that you might experience the the promises of God in some way, or would you be among the masses in Jerusalem, people that were in the streets that had an openness in them to receive and believe the good news that are questioning now, man, what should I do? What do I do to experience all God has for me? Well, see, how you answer that question largely determines how you answer the fourth one there on your outlines. What should I do? What should I do? I'm believing for many of us today, the answer to that question will be just as it was for the masses in Jerusalem that day. Verses 38 and 39, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That would be easy for us to hear those three things, repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit, and almost hear them like an equation. If you do this and you do this, then this will happen. But I don't know that that's the case. When you look throughout the New Testament, you think about like John 3, 16, whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We see people making professions of faith and getting saved, receiving salvation, apart from any conversation about baptism. We see folks being baptized uh, in water, a water baptism. We see folks being baptized and receiving the Holy Spirit, each of which happening independent of one another. But I can't help but to think about this day 
on the first day, the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God was poured out onto people, his people for the first time, that Peter's instruction would be repent, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To repent, literally meaning to turn from your ways. The Bible tells us there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. To repent is to acknowledge that, that my best intentions, my best behavior, my best step forward in being a good person does not cut it. That I'm a sinner in need of a savior. My sin has separated me from God. But because of what Jesus accomplished, I can have a relationship with him. To repent is an internal proclamation, declaration of our faith that I need a savior. Repent and be baptized. Bapti baptism is essentially an outward reflection of an inward connection. It's for us to identify ourselves with the death and resurrection of Jesus. When we baptize people, we say buried in death, raised to walk in new life. What's unique to baptism is that over the course of your life as a believer, God's gonna call you to do thousands of different things. Places that he'll call you to go, things he might call you to give, words that he might call you to share. But baptism isn't an invitation from God to participate in. It's a command from God that we are to be obedient in. So today here in Mount Pleasant and across all of our campuses, we're gonna be having baptism during response time. And if you've made a profession of faith uh, in the past but never been baptized, I would say, why wait? Today is the day for you. You showed up dry, but you can go home wet. How I many you know what I'm talking about? Every campus, we've got shorts and shirts and towels that we provided for you. There'll be people out there taking pictures just to celebrate that step of obedience. Not a good idea that God laid out for us, but a command, the first step of many of obedience that communicates to our friends and our family, our, our church community, that this faith that I hold internally will inform my beliefs, which will drive my behavior. That what I hold dear on the inside, the world is going to be able to see. So if you've made a profession of faith, man, take that step today. Let us celebrate that with you. Here in Mount Pleasant, you walk out of these side doors and everything's at a table. Your campus pastors will come up in a minute to tell you where to go and what that would look like. So repent, turn from your sin. Let people see that your faith is sincere. Be baptized. And lastly, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That you might be clothed with power from on high. You know, coming up in a traditional background or environment, this has always been unique for me because I never saw it before. It's new territory. It's hard for me to process. But it's so important for us as believers because so many of the promises of God are fulfilled through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That he'll comfort you, encourage you, that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. That he's alive within you. That he wants to empower you to do things that you never would have been able to do on your own to help you get through seasons, to help you encourage or, or bring other people into a relationship with God. I remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Josh at a first Wednesday had our staff come up to pray for people. And uh, people that wanted prayer could come forward. And this never normally happens for me, uh, but every single person that came up, seven or eight people, God gave me a picture for, like a, a vision in my mind and a word to share with them. And uh, one of the people was Pastor Roy, who's our Somerville campus pastor. And the vision, the picture that God put on my mind for him was of him wearing full body spandex. <laughs> now that'll just ruin response time, I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> then for God to ask you to share it with a brother, it's about to get weird real quick, you know? This is what that might have looked like, just to give you a visual. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I saw. I didn't want to do a real picture, Somerville, because I knew you would stumble in the future, but that's, that's kind of what I saw. Roy, he's a, he's a cyclist. He does a lot of road biking. And the word that I felt like God gave me for him was that in cycling, kind of similar to NASCAR, you can draft. And if you're behind someone that's breaking the headwind, you would get farther, faster, with much less effort than you would ever go on your own. So I felt like God was saying, tell Roy to stay tight, stay tucked, and stay behind me and that I'll get him where I want him to go, when I want him to go there, farther than he would have ever accomplished it on his own. And at the time, Roy was leading the marriage ministry here at Seacoast and questioning, feeling like there was a stirring in him for a next. And within a couple weeks, it became evident to each of us 
here on staff that Pastor Roy was to be the guy, the, the campus pastor at our Somerville campus. But what's miraculous about that is like, man, I promise you, when I pray for you, I'm not thinking about you in spandex, you know? It was a weird picture. It was a weird word. But the Spirit of God upon me had a word to encourage a child of his that he so desperately loved. When the Spirit of God is alive in you, man, he will empower you to do things that might seem weird, things that you never would have imagined doing. But we can cling to and believe when Jesus told the disciples that you will do even greater things than me. We think about the life and ministry of Jesus and think, man, well, that would be neat. But maybe that's for the pastors, you know. <laughs> that's for uh, the elders, not for me, you know. I know me. God knows me. I'm not going to be doing those things. But man, there is abundant life available for each of us. Miraculous things that God wants to do in and through us. Each of which are going to come through receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, those three words are used all throughout the New Testament. Receive, gift, and Holy Spirit. When you make a profession of faith in Jesus, the ministry of the Holy Spirit isn't something God's wanting to do to you or something he's wanting to do on you, but a work that he wants to do in you, that he might draw you into relationship with him, that he might show you the potential of what you could do, the impact that you could have uh, on those around you. So today I want to encourage you, church, what's God saying to you? Is there sin that you need to turn of and repent of? Is there bab our baptism shirts say, I have decided on them? If you've made a profession of faith but never been baptized, he is calling you today to grab the gear, to step into the waters, to respond in obedience to him. Is he calling you to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time. And I praise you, God, that your word does not return void, that it's living, that it's active, that it accomplishes exactly what it's set out to do. And so we ask today, God, if there's an openness in us, that our answer would be yes to whatever it is that you're calling us to. If there's sin to repent of, uh, if there's obedience that, that we need to act on, if it's just opening our hands that we might experience the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, whatever it might be, God, may our answer to you be yes, and may blessing follow obedience. May we see signs and wonders and healings. May we experience your miraculous power in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.